to season four of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. If you've never listened to my podcast before, then welcome to you. And please hit that subscribe button. It's hugely beneficial to us podcasters. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice. But if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this entire season has been focused on interviewing other people who did or planned to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their past. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. That's what keeps the show on the air. You can also show support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal or leaving a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. You can find the links for the books or donation options in the podcast description, of course, as well as the links to the guest. As of always, a portion of the proceeds from this podcast do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood, and I have with me for the first time ever, I have a band. You guys are going to love this. Um, This band, Crimson Overtone, is absolutely mind-blowing. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Man, I'm just so excited. Uh, So we talked a little bit before we started recording, and originally I found you guys because of my husband he's a huge metal fan and there's a lot of people who don't realize that there is christian metal out in the world now we need to introduce them to you guys because this is this is just awesome before we get into that let's go down the line real quick where are each of you guys from so as a band we're from marietta georgia but each of us have come from a lot of different places i don't know who wants to start that i I grew up in a military family. I'm Christina. Hi. Should have said that first. <laughs> but um, I grew up military, so I've lived pretty much everywhere and anywhere. Um, so it's nice to have somewhere to call home. And this is, I, I love it up here. It's great. Awesome. And Evan, what about you? So I'm a Georgia native. Um, lived in, in Illinois for three years. and glad it was only three years because it's freakishly cold up there. <laughs> <laughs> no use for cold. Nana can stay there if he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> and Rob? Uh, yeah, so I have lived in Georgia my entire life, but in a couple different cities. Um, I'm originally from uh, the east side of Atlanta, uh, born in Decatur, um, but just kind of moved around. Um, spent a little bit of time, probably about six months, up in North Dakota with other family, um, but that was... Like like what Evan said, I was it's terrible up there. So um, it was it was started snowing in August, and that's not natural. No, that's so. not natural. Oh no, yeah. no. Not, so me ended, out up, there. ended up coming back. Ended up coming back to Georgia and have been here for my whole life, pretty much. Nice. And Alex, what about you? I was born in the real south. I was born in Mexico City, uh, and then moved to Miami. Lived there many years, and moved uh, to Georgia to Marietta in 2007. Wow. Man, you guys are really from, like, all over the place. I love that you found each other. How did you guys find each other? Because that's an interesting story. It is my favorite story because we like to call this on stage. We always say it's the greatest miscommunication of my entire life. Um, Because I was in a 12-step program at the time. And the small group I was in had me helping with worship. So I felt led to do an original song that I'd written in the small group and they loved it they said oh you should record this and i thought you know like a little iphone recording just for the group and so i went to rob who was our music director at the time and rob's like oh so you want to record right (laughs) yeah and um it was the, the miscommunication came in is because i thought she was trying to like actually be an artist artist not just do a quick fun recording for some of her friends um and so we i kind of took it in another direction brought her song idea to evan who for those who don't know evan is actually my dad um uh, oh. yeah so brought it to him because me and him have recorded music and done music um for a long time together and uh, he got super excited and so we came up with some ideas and then had christina over and she was like this is not what I, <laughs> this is not the direction i, I was go- wanting to go in <laughs> It was a big miscommunication. And then I guess 
she, I guess she warmed up slowly over time. And then that's, that's kind of where lots we of, all came from. Lots of coercion. <laughs> <laughs> I call it prayerful consideration. <laughs> nice. I love how well you guys all get along, you know, especially have, to have a father son on the same band. That can't be easy. There's got to be tough days for you guys. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. <laughs> You want, to, you want to be on the phone with us for the next three hours? Because I can tell you about it. Keep in mind, I am not an actual therapist. Uh, right. <laughs> so I know all of you guys have been through your own like dark background stuff. Can you kind of briefly talk about what it is that you had to overcome? They're all pointing at me, so I guess I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you found us through, through that group because um, we were sharing our song, Girl Who Never Mattered, which is... Um, I don't know about anybody else, but it's kind of my baby because it was written out of just what I consider to be the darkest part of my life. Um, but on the other side of it, I didn't want to just write a song about life being dark and terrible. I wanted to write about what it's actually like to overcome that and to band together with other people who have overcome. So that's Girl Who Never Mattered. But it comes from a very real place. Um, at the beginning of the song, it talks about this coloring page and that on the back of the coloring page, there was a list of all these names. And the list was titled The Girls Who Never Mattered. And that's a real list. It was a real thing. Um, I was quite literally listed as a girl who never mattered. And all of the girls on that list lived, um, you know, in the same kind of a car apartment complex. And we were, um, for lack of a better term, I say digitally trafficked because we were not necessarily like sold out as much. It's kind of it was before OnlyFans existed, and it was more of a, we were put on the phone with people, or we were put on video chat with people, or we put in messaging rooms with people to do, of course, um, not so Christian-friendly favors. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, keep it a little bit PG, but <laughs> so um, we were doing a lot of that, and occasionally um, he would bring us out to the town and bring us to bars and things and, you know, sell us out to people there. But for the most part, it was, um, we'd go to a basement underneath the college cafeteria and he would film us doing various things, um, for other people, or he would assign us somebody and we would go to a specific location and be in those chat rooms, but he had all the access to that. So it's kind of crazy, but wow. thankfully I got out of that. Um, yeah. and yeah, I don't know if that's a different question, but, um, that's where I came from. That was the, the dark wow. moment. And the Lord did deliver me out of that. And I'm grateful. Man. Yeah, we're going to get to the redemption and the, the pulling you out of that. Um, probably in just a minute after the guys get their opportunity. But I, I cannot tell you how much of what you just said, I can identify with and recognize as part of my own past too. So from one heart to another, man, I'm proud of you. Amazing. Guys, what about you guys? Uh, this is Alex. Um, <clears throat> so my story is a long one. I'll make it short. Um, I've dealt with addiction, uh, mostly pornography. Um, and uh, for many years, I was caught in that. Uh, even lost a job because of it. Um, really impacted my marriage. I'm recently divorced. And I would say that a big part of that was because of that. Uh, amongst other things. Uh, also have struggled with depression, big time, uh, self-worth, um, many other things. And and what I, you know, I know you're saying we'll get to the redemption side of it, and we can, but uh, for me right now, it's an ongoing story. I'm not out of it. I'm not, I'm, I'm out of the porn part of it, but I'm not, I'm still very depressed. I deal a lot with sadness and loneliness and other things. Um, but I am glad that I can speak about it, that I can be honest about it, because I think that um, many times as Christians, we want to paint a really pretty picture where mm -hmm. everything is put together. Um, and I am not well put together, and I think that's okay for now. <laughs> so Absolutely it is. Yeah. Um, this is Rob. So for me, um, grew up in the church. You know, went to Sunday school, did that. By the time I was about eleven or twelve, was on the, on the, um, the, youth, uh, worship team, 
um, with Evan, with my dad. We both played there. And so we were at church consistently and all that other stuff. And then my life took a really, really different direction, probably around around 13 or 14, I started making some really bad decisions and hanging out with really, really wrong people. And um, by the time I was 16, I was incarcerated and sentenced to five years in jail. Um, so I got out, I did 16 to 21. Uh, got out at 21 and had no idea what I was doing in the world anymore. <laughs> that was it was it was literally a culture shock. Five years inside doing the same thing with a certain culture surrounded by certain people and then getting out and being told by the system, good luck is uh it's not easy. Even even though I had support system out here, it was still my own fight that nobody could really fully help me with. And so that was really rough. But being inside was terrible. Like day one, having to pretty much fight for my life all the time. Um wow. make sure that I didn't uh, I had to do things while I was locked up and, and, and fight things and, and fight people quite honestly, that, uh, I didn't want to have to do, but needed to, otherwise I would be in a, I would have been in a worse situation while in there that nobody could have helped me with. Um, and so getting out, realizing that I can't behave that way was a struggle. Um, it affected my relationships with potential friends that are no longer my friends. Um, it affected a lot of family relationships. Um, it even affected my marriage pretty early on, um, thinking that I needed to fight and have defenses up all the time. Um, but uh, that's 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 where my a big chunk of my trauma came from was was that experience. I can imagine. Yeah. What about you, Evan? <clears throat> so uh, much much like Rob, I grew up in a in a privilege to grow up in a, in a believing household, a generational believing household. My grandparents were missionaries in, in, uh, in Korea, and that was cool. Um, so I, I got saved at five years old, which was, and I remember it. I remember everything. So I know it was legit. Oh, <laughs> so, but the, um, my story is sort of an ongoing one too, like Alex. Um, <clears throat> I'm 46 and I was diagnosed with ADHD back in uh, back when I was about oh, 16 or 17. And for those who know, that's back when they were first starting to discover that this was like a thing, right? <laughs> so, right. So you were on Ritalin too, huh? Uh, well, yeah, I was on and off yeah. of about a whole bunch of medicines and all of them <laughs> either messed with my head or messed with my stomach. And I was like, forget you, I'm gonna do it myself. <laughs> So yep. <clears throat> that has its, its positives and its negatives. I, I tend to process information differently than most people, uh, drastically differently than most people. And over the years, that has caused huge amounts of self-doubt. And um, I've dealt all of my life. I've been ridiculed and kind of laughed at and, and poked fun at and chosen last and that sort of thing. And it's, it wasn't like... It wasn't like I wasn't able to do everything else. I just did it different. I approached everything different. And so it's it's something that kind of sticks with you when you grow up that way. You know what I mean? And right. um, and it's through Celebrate Recovery has helped a lot with that. I mean, like Rob said, it, it affected my marriage and d still does at some level. <laughs> I'm much better than I used to be. <laughs> but uh, it takes practice, you know. But um, it's I go through days where I'm in drastic, very, very deep depression. But fortunately with through the scriptures and the background that I had in faith and and the group of people that I surround myself with, you know, it's it's I can get through those days and, and process them properly. But I mean, yeah, it's like Alex said, it's an ongoing thing. And um sometimes I'm on top of it and sometimes I'm not. We write yeah. about that. That's what that's why we're in a metal band. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. And, you know, I, I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to who feel like doing the the writing has been one of the greatest opportunities for healing. You know, you guys have been given this incredible gift and you work so well together. Do you write your songs together also? So it's an interesting process and it's always an ongoing shift in process. A lot of times... Um, I'll write a lot of the lyrical content or Evan will write a lot of the lyrical content though. Um, I do occasionally poke and prod at the other guys and say, Hey, you should help with this song. But um, 
Evan and I are mostly the lyrical writers and then um, Evan and Rob do a lot of the musical structures um, surrounding all of that. They'll come up with these riffs or these lines, these really cool progressions and they'll come in and um, you can always tell it's going to be a good song when they come in and they say, oh, here's this thing I wrote. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I've got lyrics for that. And that's usually kind of what ends up happening. And then from there, that's where we kind of all have to get together and figure it out very it, cool it's actually a new process now um for a long time it was christine and myself doing the writing and um the band has been has moved to several different phases and this is i'm really excited about this phase because there's a new and fresh unity i mean there's still challenges and struggles just because it's hard to figure out how to do all this stuff but but for me personally, there's this fresh unity in this fresh um, direction that we have. And we, we literally just yesterday, we're talking about a new writing process where we can all literally be an integral part of the structure of the, the building of each song. So that's pretty exciting. That's awesome. Very cool. So what helped each of you guys to be able to heal from your past, from everything that you've had to go through. Let's start with Christina. Cause we started with you the first time with the, with the um, trauma background. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing was just first getting out. Um, and I wish I had a, a cooler story of like being rescued all heroically or something, but it, it really wasn't that exciting. Um, more tragic than exciting um I attempted suicide and then uh the doctors kind of were like oh wait this wasn't just somebody who was mentally ill this is somebody who's been abused pretty intensely and so they they sent me home and I went into a, a mandated recovery program so that gave me an introduction to what 12 step could look like to what recovery could look like at the time I didn't think I was being abused I just thought that I made a lot of bad choices. I put a lot of the blame back on myself and that came out through a lot of different addictions, pills, self-harm, whatever you want to call it. Um, but then when I eventually moved on and, you know, I got a job, I started moving kind of moving forward in my life. I realized that if I wanted to actually move on from what had happened, I needed to start taking that recovery seriously. So I got in to celebrate recovery. I went through the step study. I got myself a sponsor. I got myself a good community of people around me who helped build me up and push me in the right direction. And by surrounding myself with other people who had been through not necessarily the same extent of the abuse that I'd been through, but who'd also been through abuse, who knew what those signs and symptoms were. It opened up a whole new world to me that I didn't think was possible. It opened up support that I didn't know existed. And it made me realize that, you know, I didn't have to go through it alone. And then, yeah, that's been, I think the biggest help. Cause I'll, I'll be honest. I I'm not a, I'm not opposed to therapy, but I've yet to have a good experience with therapy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll stick with my support groups for now. <laughs> I love that. And so having that support network around you is so important when you're recovering from basically any kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you guys, let's start with Alex. Alex, how are you managing things these days? I know uh, you say it's an ongoing process. Yeah, I'm going to take it back to something that Christina said. Because um, there was abuse in my past and it was only until a therapist pointed it out that I put it together um, because a lot of it I have blamed myself for. And all of it, a lot of it, of course, I am guilty for. Um, you start as a child, you're abused, you learn coping mechanisms. Um, you really don't know any better. You don't know who to go to. Um, I remember going to somebody in the church and them looking at me weird and, and so never trusting. And my father wasn't trustworthy for stuff like this. Um, so... Uh, it was a long process. I started seeing negative, uh, you know, repercussions from my actions. Uh, it started uh, affecting my job, started affecting my uh, marriage. Um, and then just as a human being, uh, feeling constant guilt and then asking for forgiveness. 
and then doing it again and guilt and forgiveness and doing it again over and over again. Uh, the heart kind of takes a beating um, until uh, my wife gave me an ultimatum. Well, I, I lost the job because of porn. And then my wife gave me an ultimatum and I got help. Uh, this is in Miami. Uh, there was a group called Faithful and True. And it was a group of guys and it was all about that, uh, getting together, having accountability, seeing what the Bible says about stuff. Um, and I've been in other groups, Every Man's Battle, um, you know, the uh, 12 Step Recovery with a uh, Celebrate Recovery. Um, so for me, it's been a really long process. I go to therapy every two weeks. Um, and I have, you know, other like a men's Bible study and just I've, I've tried to build as much support as I can uh, because that's what I need right now. Uh, thank God I'm free from porn, and I've been free for porn from for years. But struggle with a lot of other things, um, and I think m most addictions they usually have something going on under them. It's usually not the addiction. Uh, like I've heard say, you know, people don't drink because they're thirsty. <laughs> they're trying to, <laughs> yeah, they're trying to they're trying to numb something or deal with something and cope with something. Right. Um, so, um, but yeah, that's just slowly, that's how I've found uh, freedom and forward movement, uh, just finding support and being honest with myself and with God and with others. So That's awesome. And Alex, I may have to steal that phrase. People don't drink because they're thirsty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think that's brilliant. And that is one of the top uh, familiar trauma reactions that people have mm -hmm. is some form of a self-medication. And usually it's through... Uh, drugs or alcohol and it's such a hard battle man it's i i went through that i was there so i'm proud of you keep going man you're you're well on your way um uh, evan rob who wants to go first between you guys i'll start um so for me it's not it's not something i'm not <sighs> words um <laughs> they're hard yeah um My past and my trauma and my condition is not something that uh, it has ever gone away, and I personally don't think it ever will. Um, I think that I have learned over the years to manage it, um, to not do the things that I have the tendency to want to do, um, things that I learned while I was locked up um mindsets that i had um opinions that i had um i've learned to control that stuff and and put it aside um of course through you know same avenues um that we've already been talking about you know just talking with other people having accountability with some people um holding myself accountable reading scripture you know relying on god to take away the anger that i shouldn't have um, the impulses that I shouldn't act on, um, things like that. But I don't think it's something that I have ever really recovered them, recovered from. Um, I think it's just something that I have to manage. It's something that I just, uh, that I need to continue to work on becoming better at not showing that part of me that in my opinion, ultimately is still there um, just because of how flesh works. Um, but it's really, for me, it's just about letting my spirit man be more powerful and stronger than my flesh. Um, and I think that's, that's been the battle over the last several years since I got out is, is allowing that to happen is weakening my flesh, humbling my flesh um, so that those things don't come up and don't happen. Yeah. And Evan? <clears throat> so, um, first, really, the, 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 the only thing that holds me together most of the time is God's Word. And that is not just a religious statement. Um, my head goes all sorts of places. One of the advantages and disadvantages of ADHD is the amount of thoughts that run through my head at any given millisecond. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'm never not thinking of something. And uh, what happens is if I get on an emotional downward spiral, the negative thoughts that run through my head are probably 10 times what other people go through. And if it wasn't for the solidarity and my, my long experience with seeing God's word be true, just in the nature, watching the nature of people, whether it be um, social situations, political situations, it's just very interesting to watch how people living a normal godless life and i'm not saying godless in the sense of oh they're so godless i don't mean that i mean most people live a godless life because they don't recognize we're not taught as a world as a society we're not taught to recognize that god exists and so when most people live their normal lives you watch them deconstruct and fall apart for all of the very same reasons that the scripture says all the time and it's really interesting to take that third party and see that. And so by seeing that, when these negative thought processes, these negative spirals start happening, if I can't get them under control with Scripture, I go to people who I know can I can hear the words. I can hear someone else say the words um, and reaffirm the things that I know that I read. You know, you hear it from one source, it's it's just a thought. You hear it from two sources, it might be true. You hear it from three sources, okay. The scripture itself says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing is known, right? Right. So um, that's the biggest thing. Um, the second is, I've got some key people in my life that are stable. And um, one of them is my best friend, Justin. I have no idea how in the world that guy is so stable, but he is. And <laughs> one of the very few people in the world that actually doesn't have an issue with my insanity. <laughs> 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 and, uh, <clears throat> and he's, he, he always encourages me with scripture when I'm down and I, I do the same for him. Conversely, he would tell you the same thing. Um, and then uh, my folks are still around and really, really healthy and strong. They're in their they're in their mid to late seventies, but they're still on top of the game, and they've been a really good source. Um, my wife has gone through her own set of circumstances, but on the backside of those circumstances, the wisdom that she has come out with has really been helpful for me in a lot of perspectives that don't pertain to just biblical character, just natural life. So that's helped me a lot. Um, and then being with the band, this has been the greatest challenge and both and the greatest reward too, because I have to put these things that I say I believe in into practice. And sometimes I mess it up really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's just encouraging because I can, you know, I, I see the results. And then through this context, you can actually see these funny things that happen that that have to be orchestrated by God. They can't accidentally happen, you know, the way that some songs will will show up and the way equipment shows up at random that we didn't have to pay for is kind of amazing. <laughs> blows my mind. But all of that goes into the process that God is real. He is here. His word is true. I don't care what anybody else says. If I understand if I don't understand it, it just means I don't understand it. It doesn't mean it's not true. <laughs> and, and that's that's my rock and my foundation and that's how i can move on through life and then obviously there's there's men's groups and things like that i got a couple of other buddies that i've just been getting with and it's nice to discuss the truth of, of god's word there too but that's that's how i hold on very cool have you get, have you ever had a uh, crisis of faith while you were going through all of this stuff i've just had several several weeks ago <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, it, it, it's happened. It's happened a number of occasions over the years. Um, I have been at the point from time to time. I've been at the point mentally of suicide, never tempted, but always been right there at the cusp. And yeah. that was really scary. Um, and when you when you start feeling those thoughts run through your head, it's like, man, that's terrifying. Yeah. And, um, and that's when you 
that's sort of the beginning of a crisis of, of, of faith. You know what I mean? You, right. you really have to start questioning what's real and what's not at that point. And, yeah. and the Lord's always been there. I'm not going to say it's been all warm and fuzzy. I think that's a, I think that's a, a drastic miscommunication in the modern church because it's not always warm and fuzzy, but it's, he's there nonetheless. Right. Yeah, okay. Churches are filled with broken people. That's the way it should be. Yep. Yeah. That's something I think is not communicated enough. I feel like it's it's called a crisis of faith, but it's less a crisis and more of an altercation, if you will. <laughs> um, I like you know, that. We, we know um, Jacob, he was called Israel, which means to wrestle with God. You know, it doesn't mean to, you know, to have a cordial conversation with him, but to wrestle. And so when when we go through these difficult circumstances, it is only natural to question, is God real? Is God good? Does God care? Because we can't see him. We can't feel him. We can't like bring him into our home necessarily as a physical human being, but we have to ask those questions in order to come to the very real conclusion that he is real. He is good. He is here and he is faithful in all of it. You can't see that when you're in the middle of it. That's why we we have to wrestle with God. We have to question God's goodness and God's character because in questioning God's character, that's where he reveals himself. And that's why we're in a metal band. <laughs> <laughs> and Rob, what's it been like growing up having Evan as your dad? Do you feel like that helped you to understand a lot of uh, your own struggles? Feel free to answer freely, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um... Say that last part again. Do, I feel what? <laughs> Do you feel like watching your dad's struggles helped you to at any point help you to understand your own struggles? Some, um, but to be quite honest, he hasn't. We haven't been through the same things. Uh, right. So. I mean, yes, in certain things, because I mean, just as men period we go through a lot of the same things just as much as you know women can understand each other as well and the different things that you know they go through but um it's just different circumstances like i um different different things that have happened in both of our lives so it's a yes and no question yeah uh, but i i'd say for the ones that were the struggles are similar yes um we have the joke of uh, if I need to know what to do, look at him to know what not to do. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a running true. joke that he's that he's always told me growing up, um, which is sometimes true. But then there's also other times where it's like, OK, you know, what do I need to do in this specific situation? Well, he made it through the situation. OK, similarly. So what how did he handle it and things like that? Um, and sometimes I'll be like, well, he didn't do that right. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, it just depends on the situation. Nice. Truth, all truth. <laughs> Sounds like good opportunities to learn from somebody else's mistakes. Yes. Yeah. Please. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex, have you always been a believer? Have you had uh, kind of uh, struggles with your belief? Um, I was I was raised a believer in Mexico. It was interesting because we were the only evangelical family surrounded by all Catholics. Oh wow! Mexico is very Catholic. Yeah. Um. But really, I accepted Christ when I when we moved to Miami. Uh, I was around eleven or twelve. Um, but a lot of things happened at the same time. That was the time that the abuse took place. That was the time that my parents got divorced. Um, I've gone, you know, crisis of faith. Um, I mean, to be honest, it happens more often than I like to admit, um, because. Sometimes I think that the world should be a certain way if you're a believer. Um, but no, and you see in the Bible and you see Job and you see a bunch of other people who suffered a lot. Um, and yeah, they were believers. And and you see Paul, who's one of my favorites. Um, and he suffered, but he had this incredible positive attitude. And, you know, in, in good things and bad things, he learned to be content, etc. Um so yeah, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers the question. I'm sorry, I rambled a little bit. No, it was a beautiful ramble. I liked it. 
It was a good answer. It's, it's so true. You do see a lot of suffering in the Bible. And there's so many people that say, but if God exists, then why does X, Y, Z exist? And it, it exists because, well, you know what? I'm going to let you, you guys answer this. What do you, what do you believe is the answer when people say, if God exists, then why do these bad things exist? So I, I literally just was having this conversation with a good friend and I'll try They're laughing at me over here because they're like, oh, here he goes on his tangent. It's going to be six months before he's done. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the short answer is, and this is a hard answer, but you can apply it to literally every aspect of life in all of its stages. Without pain, we don't know good. Yeah. That is, that is the answer. And it's not that what I discover is that God allows me enough pain to where I fall on my face, but I've got just enough energy to get up again. Now I'm pretty mad when I get back up and I'm definitely not comfortable, but what I've been able to do over the years is to be able to get back up and recognize, Oh, I'm a whole heck of a lot stronger than I was when I fell down, you know? And so it's kind of like if, if you're a big workout buff, right? What do you have to do to build the muscle? Well, you got to tear it. And then once the muscle's torn a little bit, then you got to feed it properly. You got to keep the toxins out of it. You got to, and then you got to retrain it. That's how the muscle grows and strengthens. Well, it's the same way with a kid, right? So you want to, you want to raise a good kid. You're like, don't touch the hot stove and the kid's going to touch the hot stove. Well, if you get mad and smack them around, that's not going to teach them any lessons. Be like, see, now your finger hurts. So, <laughs> so what do you do? You bandage it up you know, and, and, and you, you take care of them and say, now don't touch the hot stove. You see what I'm talking about? And, <laughs> and hopefully it clicks. If not, then you just laugh at them again when they do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole point is, is eventually pain is going to be the very thing that's like, I understand what good is now because then when you experience good, because, well, I'm not supposed to touch the hot stove. Hey, my finger doesn't hurt and dinner sure does taste good. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And, uh, and then, or, or like if we go back to the gym thing, you know, after six months at the gym under strict training, now you're, you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know? <laughs> um, and then uh, it, it, I was also mentioning, I was also mentioning um, to this friend I was talking with, you know, we have a lot of respect for, for uh, uh, military folks, you know, guys, Navy SEAL. Oh yeah. That dude's so bad to the bone. He's so cool. How do you think he got that way? Right. He was under a commanding officer screaming in his face while he's in his skivvies on an ice sheet at three o'clock in the morning after 24 hours of no sleep. <laughs> That's how he got that way. That's how he got bad to the bone is he dealt with pain to the point that he was strong enough to sustain it. Now, not only can he sustain himself through it, but he can sustain others. That, that is absolutely beautiful. That's the short version. So I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? Or are you guys good? <laughs> I'll add a little bit. Um, I've been dealing with that question a lot. And I've, I come from a more negative point of view. I really struggle with it. Um, I think of Christina, who I say as my sister and almost think of her, my daughter, she could be my daughter. No. And the things that she went through and I've, you know, I'm in, I'm in a 12 step program in, in celebrate recovery and they see, they show, uh, testimonies and many of them are a child started off being abused, abandoned, and I really, really struggle. I, I struggle. I get really angry. I ask why God. Um, I get the concept of, uh, you know, I, I just went through a divorce and, and I'm brokenhearted and really struggling with it. I get the concept of uh, people struggle and hurt so they can later bless other people um, going through the same struggle and hurt. Um, but at this moment, that's not good enough for me. And I'm just being honest. So, uh, so I can do a lot of mental gymnastics, but I'm still struggling with that question. Yeah. I heard, of, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, I think a lot of people do, Alex. I don't think you're alone in that at all. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I heard a really interesting answer to that question sort of recently in that 
just that it's the wrong question asking you know if god is good why do bad things happen it kind of flips the conversation on its head the negative things in our lives can't make us look at god different because god does not create you know god is the giver of every good gift god is the creator of every good thing and that goodness got corrupted when sin entered the world so it's not a matter of whether or not we can trust in god but whether or not we should hate what has happened to his creation that the creation as a whole is corrupted the creation as a whole is groaning in eager expectation for the glory of god to be revealed as it says in scripture but that's because like it's not just people that were corrupted when sin entered the earth god cursed the ground he made it to where we had to toil to work we had to toil in childbirth we had to <laughs> suffer in all these different areas because sin doesn't just corrupt the person sin corrupts the world there weren't natural disasters before sin there weren't um you know problems with there there wasn't sickness before sin all of that stuff happened when sin happened so it's not a question of is god good it's the earth is is just bad the earth is just broken and so realistically like it it just it should make us angry, like righteously angry at what the enemy has done to this place that God created and to the people God created and to the earth that God created. There is a righteous anger that is intended in that question. That question is an angry question. It's not coming from people who genuinely want to know the answer. It's an angry question and it has a right to be angry because we have, I mean, God hates sin and so should we, right? At least right. that's kind of it's a different perspective, but I, it, I've i kind of grasped onto that a little bit. Can, if, if I can really quick tag off on, onto that. Yes. Yeah. It's, I love what she said there because what that is, is that it actually proves that God is good because he is good because we can, he uses our pain. To make us stronger. He uses it inevitable in spite of, right? So we rise. It's like the whole Phoenix thing. We rise out of the ashes if we believe in him, if we trust in his reality and give up our own negativity, which is the challenges we've all been talking about. It's not like we've mastered it. You know what I mean? We're sitting here right in the middle of it. But knowing full well, because we've experienced the good out of like Rob said, the humility to, to back off, you know what I mean? Our own, our own senses, then he can take all this terrible stuff that's happening and it's going to happen and he'll turn it to good. Not just good for one person, but good for exponential. It's like a, it's like an upside down, uh, what, <laughs> what is it the pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's sort of the way it works though, because you know, one person, when you experience God's goodness, that is an that is an unforgettable moment. And anybody who's experienced God's goodness at any point in time, even if you're mad at him for the junk you're going through because of the sin that Christina was talking about that we ought to deal with, you can't forget that moment, right? And so when you've experienced that, you're going to tell other people about it. You have to. And it doesn't mean you're going to be banging on doors, but you're going to be in conversation with some random person. You know, I experienced this and, and it's this this verse means something to me or something like that. Are you going to put it in music or are you going to put it in a book, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. I've experienced that multiple times myself. I had X, Y, Z happen and I know you probably won't believe this, but I've got to tell you. Yeah, and it's a cool moment when you can see that on somebody's face. And they recognize that what you're telling them is absolutely true. And it did happen. And it is unbelievable. But that's God speaking through us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you guys each have a favorite uh, a book in the Bible or a verse in the Bible that really speaks to you or a character that you, you really identify with? Proverbs and James. Okay. Why is that? Well, James says it best. 
If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And Proverbs is full of wisdom. Nice. Applicable wisdom, I should say. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, what about you, Alex? Um, favorite character would be Paul. I yeah. uh, really, really like him. Um, he, uh, not to sound cheesy, but sold out for Jesus. Um, his his attitude is fantastic, and he was, you know, stoned and shipwrecked and jailed and uh, whatever. Just amazing. Like, like I want to be like him when I grow up, quote unquote. Um, <laughs> um, favorite verse. Uh, it's funny. I, I I get the numbers confused. I believe it's Matthew sixteen five. Maybe I I don't know. I don't remember. But uh, it's the one where. Um, where it says, greater love has no man than this is to die for his brother or give his life for his brother or his friend. Um, I like that verse a lot for the obvious reason. You know, there's this huge sacrifice behind love. But um, in, in parenting, in marriage, in relationship, giving your life as a sacrifice is not only willing to die for them if the opportunity came up but it's living for them daily. So, um, you know, I might take a bullet for somebody who I love, and that's a one-moment decision. But daily loving my wife, daily, daily loving my children, daily loving my coworkers, my friends, to me that's a little bit harder um, because it's a constant thing. you got to forgive much more than 70 times 7. Um, you have to have patience and kindness and, you know, just real love. So that's, that's why that's my favorite verse. Beautiful. And Rob, you've been kind of quiet. Have you got a favorite? Um, yes and no. Uh, it depends on what's going on in life. Um, all of it speaks to me at various times. Um, all of it makes me feel the same depending on, what I'm going through in life and you know, what the Lord is trying to speak to me through the scripture. Um, none of it, none of it very specifically, like there's not one verse over another that makes me more feel more loved or feel more empowered or spiritual. It's it, it all is equal across the board. Um, but the, the yes side of it is um, there has been a verse that got me through a lot early on Um from just the point of when I got locked up all the way until um, uh, probably just a few years ago where where all of it started making me feel this way. But that one verse that got me through a lot was, um, well, here I am forgetting numbers. He rubbed off, Alex. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. What is it? Ecclesiastes 4.13. I believe it's somewhere. It's, it's Ecclesiastes four. I know that uh, I think it's around 13, but it says um, for out of your prisons, come forth your Kings. Um, oh. And it was the, the context is it's better to be a young, wise man, a young, a, a poor, but young, wise man than an old and foolish King who um, doesn't speak wisdom. Basically. That actually is um, worse in Proverbs too. <laughs> but that's great. Yeah, yeah. Alex just showed me it's it's Ecclesiastes four fourteen actually, um, is that verse specifically? But that got me through a lot of stuff. Um, just being in that particular predicament because, um, I've always been I, I had to grow up really really fast due to a lot of a lot of factors in life. Just a lot of abandonment, separation, um, literally being told one time that you know, hey, you're the you're the man of the house you know, you need to take care of your mom and sisters and stuff. And that weighed really heavy on me. And that was, that phrase was said to me when I was 12 years old. So wow. uh, it was, I had to, I had to grow up in a lot of areas really, really fast, especially when I got locked up. Um, you can't be, you can't be a little boy in that place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I went from being a teenager to not being a teenager really, really fast mentally anyway. 
And um, a lot of a lot of people would come up to me and be surprised how young I was. Um, a lot of people used to assume I was older um, and said I didn't really act like I was in my early 20s and stuff. Um, only in certain ways. Some other ways I was kind of, you know, I was a dumb 20 year old. But uh, <laughs> in a lot of other ways I was not. And so, um, but still being young, you still get that assumption of, oh, you're young. You don't know what you're talking about um, from a lot of people. And so remembering that verse that God actually called me, that, that God says that I can be just as wise as anybody else, even though I'm young. And there's even scripture that says, don't, you know, I, and I'm really butchering the, the, the actual verse here, but it basically says, don't let anybody diminish you just because you're young. That's um, and so just have just remembering that got me through a lot of that okay yes i'm young but i'm not an idiot kind of feelings that i had to fight a lot um but like i said a few years ago um a lot of that changed i think probably probably around when i got married a lot of it changed where i guess you know i, I you, there's always a shift when you get married there's a shift for both for, for both sides when you get married going from being not husband or wife to being a husband and wife um, and I think when that shift happened, a lot of the scripture opened up for me in different ways. And I started to rely on a lot more of the scripture to make me feel the way um, it was intended to make me feel and strengthen me the way it was intended to make me, to strengthen me and not just that verse alone. So, yeah. Awesome. Christina, have you got a favorite? It's an odd choice, but Jonah resonates with me a lot. Um not necessarily the whole fish situation, um, but the end of that story where Jonah has gone and he has literally been, you know, called to not just love his enemy, but like share the gospel with his enemy. Um, people who were notorious for like horrific crimes against the that the nation of Israel. And then he goes up on this hilltop and he sits there and he just waits and is like, all right, God, I did what you asked me to go get him, strike him down. And God won't do it. And then God gives him this plant, this beautiful, lovely plant thing. And Jonah just falls in love and he's so excited. And he continues to sit and wait in the hot, in the sun with this plant that eventually shrivels up and dies, and he complains, God, like, you killed my plant, but you won't kill the enemy. What are you doing? And God says to him, you care more about a plant. Like, you're sitting here upset about a plant. I'm upset over the hearts of these people. We're not the same. And that hit me really hard because for a long time, um, the community that I was trafficked in, just men, and I had a really hard time with everybody. And I would just sit there. I, I did my due diligence. I went to the police. I reported it within the statute of limitations. And my abuser still walked free because there just wasn't enough evidence against him and not enough people would come forward. And I sat there for years. I wouldn't pray about it, but I was just sitting, waiting, waiting for God to just get him. Or <laughs> someone to just get him. And not just him, but everybody like him. And my mom said to me, would you, like, do you really want them all to go to hell? And I said, yes. I, I had to say yes, because that was where my heart was. It was so broken and so hurt. And it was reading that story and hearing God say to Jonah, we're not the same, that I realized that, well, Jonah and I kind of are. And I was waiting for the demise of people instead of actively praying for their salvation and knowing that. God, if God can fix me, he can fix them too. It's not easy and it's still hard and I still struggle with the anger a lot. But that's why Jonah resonates with me so much because I don't want to just sit there and complain about trees and plants and worms. I want to sit here and have the heart that God does for the people that abused me. And that's something that's really, really hard to do. Oh, absolutely. Oh my gosh. I know that struggle. So I always have one last question that I ask people before I let them go. And this one can kind of take some people by surprise. So I'm going to let you guys decide who's going to answer it first, who's going to answer it last. It gives you guys a little bit of time to think about it if you need to. 
but it's my favorite question always. <laughs> <laughs> what is one thing that you love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? You're asking the screamy emo people to talk about what they like. <laughs> I know. That's, that's why it's so hard. It really is a difficult question. The first time it was ever asked of me, I think I probably took three days to think about it. I don't think I have that kind of time to wait around for you guys. So hopefully you can come up with something a little bit faster than three days from now. I think, I think <laughs> is already, so we'll let him go since he thinks so highly of himself. <laughs> Not that I think so highly of himself, <laughs> because I have a problem with thinking not highly enough, I'm told. <laughs> Aggravating. But um, it's the very thing that causes most of my problems in the first place, which is how fast I can think. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's both my greatest struggle and my greatest blessing. Because given the opportunity, I can come up with about 10 scenarios of any given thing really, really fast, and any of them are functional. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that. It makes it fun. It makes writing music fun. It makes being, a, it makes being a mechanic fun. It makes building things and making things fun. I'm just a general right brain guy with one left brain cell. And uh, um, it just makes it fun. I like it. Very cool. That's a good attribute to have. Who's yeah. next? You have yours. Okay, I'll go next, Alex. Um, first of all, I was saddened when you said it couldn't be a physical feature because I'm extremely good looking. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don't tell my husband I agree. <laughs> wow. <laughs> all right. Um, so for me, and I'm, I'm going to say the same words, uh, Evan said it's it's I think it's a strength but it's also a weakness I get really attached to people and I really love people um when I get to know them a little bit and hang out with them whatever like I if I'm not careful I'll go overboard caring for them maybe to my detriment um um so I need to learn how to do that wisely or whatever so I think that's a good attribute but again it has to be guarded but yeah, that's it. That's awesome. And, and you're right. It can be both a strength and a weakness. But if you know how to play it right, you can absolutely use this as a strength. Yeah, he's there now. He's still they're, thinking. They're playing still paper, rock, scissors. Just okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Flip a coin. <laughs> Brain cells. Anyway. Uh, uh, I'll go ahead and go. Christina's still thinking. Um, Luckily, I just thought of mine right before it was my turn. Um, I will also say that mine is good and bad. Um, I'm very firm in the decisions that I make. Um, it doesn't matter what that decision is. I'm very, if, if I'm going to, if I decide this is the direction that uh, we're going as a family and it's with my family, my wife already knows that's what we're doing and she's not going to convince me otherwise. Uh, <laughs> if I decide I'm going to, stand up against somebody and per, and in my head i'm like i'm prepared to fight this person then that's what it is and that's how i'm going into it it's just it's i'm very firm on on when i make decisions not much can um take me away from what i decide to do and the reason that's a good thing is because if i hear that i need if, if i hear from god that i need to do something that's what's going to happen it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what Anybody else says, um, if God says to do it, then that's what I'm going to do. It doesn't matter what my bandmates say. It doesn't matter what my wife says. It um, doesn't matter what my pastor says. If God said do it, I'm doing it, and nothing's going to convince me otherwise. Now, where it comes in detrimentally is, you can ask my wife, it makes me extremely hard-headed um, <laughs> when I am wrong about something. Um, she will tell you that all day long. Um, I have, however, learned over the last four years of marriage to listen to her more often. Um, as a, I suggest for any man who thinks it's a good idea to get married, uh, <laughs> prepare yourself to <laughs> be wrong a lot. Um, but no, it, it, it makes me a little bit hard headed, um, not just in marriage, but even with this band stuff. Um, I, I have found that I have no issues getting into arguments with any of them. Um, 
And sometimes we come to an agreement and sometimes we don't come to an agreement and I have to apologize for being hardheaded. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's, it's, 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 you know, the whole blessing and curse thing. Um, it's good for decision-making when I know that it's scriptural thing that I need to do, but it gets in the way when it comes to um, uh, knowing when I need to back off of something and versus knowing when to stand my ground. It, it, it gets a little, the balance is the difficult part. Yeah. I can see how that would be a, a struggle. All right. Figured it out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Um, <laughs> I don't think anybody will disagree with me when I say I tend to be a very analytical person. I like to take in a lot of information and then put that information into little boxes and then take the boxes and be like, this is the best box based on all of the information, data, statistics, um, just all of that stuff. It, it just gets me excited. It's a weird thing to get happy about, but I love for not being a very mathematically inclined person, I really like numbers and I really like stats. Um, and that has helped a lot on the business side of things and on keeping things organized, keeping things scheduled. Um, but it, it can also definitely be a problem when I come in and I'm like, here's all the information and it's, it's way too much or it's way too much that hasn't considered other options. So I guess I can be a little hard headed too in that regard, but I, <laughs> I definitely think just the ability to take it all in and try, I, I try very hard to take in, even when it comes to opinions saying, well, let's just gather everybody's opinion and let's figure out based on everybody's opinion, what the best course of action is. It's, it kind of pays into that too. It, I've been told I'm very diplomatic, which can be good and bad. <laughs> um, <'cause laughs> sometimes I need to be a little bit firmer on things and a little bit more. Um, what, What's the word I'm looking for? But, well, I guess firm, uh, assertive maybe is the word That's I'm looking word. for. A yeah, little bit more assertive. But uh, I'm very analytical and diplomatic. And, and that is, I guess, like everybody said, both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> you know, you guys have had really good insight as to, into who you are now. Beyond what it is that you've gone through. And I just... You guys should know that you are all absolutely amazing. And I admire each of you for the journeys that you've had to go through and are still going through. And the fact that you're not giving up and that you're out here spreading this message. And you guys are incredible people. God has definitely given you a, a heck of a task to get through, but you're doing it. That's amazing. Where do people go when they want to get your music? I was just saying thank you and thank you for what you're doing. Oh, of course, of course. No, it's absolutely my pleasure. I love being able to talk to people like you. I, I wouldn't have had this opportunity if I didn't have my podcast. So it really is a guilty pleasure for me. <laughs> it's kind of like us playing on stage. It's a sa similar guilty pleasure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, darn, we have to play music. That'll be fun. <laughs> Where do people go if they want to grab your music? If they want to grab your new album? We always say, we are where you are. We're on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, YouTube, all of the social media things. We don't use Twitter very much. We're technically there, but it, it's not active, so you'd be very bored. But <laughs> Instagram, Facebook, um, sometimes TikTok when I feel like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but all of the general social media places. And if you want to listen to our music, we just released uh, about a month ago, Girl Who Never Mattered and... We're very proud of that one. So definitely go check that one out on whatever your favorite streaming platform is. And it's, it's really easy if you go to the website, www.crimsonovertone.com. It has all of the links for all of that stuff. Fabulous. And I love the cover art for Girl Who Never Mattered. I know I said that other question was going to be my last question, but this really is my last question. How did you guys come up with this a cover art? Because it's beautiful. Um, that was me. I, I like to play around. I do a lot of the graphic design stuff for the bands. Like sometimes people will come with different ideas, but then I put it in to the computer or the phone and, and actually play around with it. But I knew I wanted, we've kind of got this character going on. It wasn't even on purpose, but this faceless girl thing has shown up a lot in a lot of the artwork we've created. Um, so I knew that I wanted that to be represented because when you think about somebody who doesn't matter, it's not somebody who is in clear view. It's somebody who's just sort of vague and isn't really a human being, if, if that makes sense. 
Um, and so, and then I wanted the coloring page to be represented, but I didn't want it to be too feminine. You know, I wanted to represent the, the different colors, the different, the rainbow of personalities that were in that situation in a way that wasn't, you know, too overly specific, too graphically dark. Um, I wanted to show the, the sort of contrast between there are these really bright, beautiful people who have been made to feel like they don't have a face, that they don't have a, an identity, and that, you know, ultimately, hopefully, you know, we can bring some color back into that, um, that place that has been made to be so, so dark and so monochromatic. I don't know if that made sense, kind of rambled, but it, <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> no, it totally makes sense. I love it. I absolutely love this artwork. People need to go over to the website, check it out, um, head over to Spotify, check it out, listen to it. You guys are going to love this. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Christina, Evan, Rob, Alex, you guys are incredible. And I love you. You're amazing. On the back of a coloring page was a list of names. And beside each name, a color. Behind each color, a story at the top of the page in bold black ink. It read the girls who never mattered.
doesn't matter. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. There you'll find links on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted. I can say that. I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune in to my other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash growth from darkness. Oh, 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 oh,